This is The Future Of, where experts share their vision of the future and how their work is helping shape it for the better. I'm Jessica Morrison. Around the world, untold numbers of artefacts sit in Western museums and libraries, taken from their original homes in places such as Africa and the Middle East during wars and colonial occupations. In recent years, there have been an increase in calls to return these artefacts, with governments in countries including France, Germany and the UK finally beginning to make amends. As the practice increases, what is the future for these artefacts? And on the other side of the discussion, the future of the institutions that once held them. To discuss this topic, with me today is Dr Yilga Gala Wudayes, a lecturer in human rights from Curtin University and the winner of a 2019 Australian Humanities Travelling Fellowship. Thank you for coming in today, Yilga. Thank you for having me, Jessica. To start with, what inspired you to become an expert in this field? Thank you. Uh, I think the first uh, sort of trigger for me was the presence of the uh, replica of the Ark of the Covenant, uh, or sometimes called the Tablets of Ethiopia in the British Museum. These uh, tablets exist in the British Museum right, starting from the, uh, 1868 uh, at the Battle of Magdala where the British looted these this, um, important items of Ethiopia. So uh, the presence of these treasures, which are sacred, uh, spiritually significant treasures, is significant for Ethiopians, especially myself included, because I grew up in a place called Lalibela in Ethiopia. It's a historical town where uh, King Lalibela in the 13th century, uh, he, you know, carved about 11, 11 churches out of a massive single rock. There's this big rock as big as a village. And they started carving churches starting from the roof and created these beautiful churches which still exist today. And one of the main purposes of these churches was to house the, uh, the replicas of the Ark of the Covenant. Because in the uh, spiritual mythology or belief of Ethiopians, the presence of the Ark of the Covenant represents the presence of God in places where these arcs are. Uh, residing. So all over Ethiopia, in several villages, people gather and make their houses and in the middle they create a small church and put the Ark of the Covenant in the middle and organize their lives, their social interaction and so on on the base of this, these spiritual um, treasures. Now, where the presence of the Ark of the Covenant, when it was taken uh, from Ethiopia and are housed uh, uh, in London, of course, there are so many replicas of the Ark of the Covenant, so there's a special way of making them in Ethiopia too. But any Ark of the Covenant which exists anywhere represents this um, sacredness and the presence of this Ark, uh, Ark of the Covenant in the British Museum. Uh, is a constant offense to this tradition. When I go to the British Museum and I ask myself, what do I do? How do I relate with these uh, important icons of my tradition? If it was in Ethiopia, if they were housed, for example, in a church, people will bow, will worship, will pray, and feel connected with the land and their creators and the society. But if I go to the British Museum, is this a holy place now? Am I going to worship? Am I going to pray or am I going to ignore these important spiritual icons uh, which really define a lot about Ethiopia? Because Ethiopians, uh, are, Ethiopia is the only country that was never colonized. And uh, when they fought against the uh, Italian colonizers, they carried the Ark of the Covenant to the war. If the Ark of the Covenant goes to the war with the people, nobody runs away. Uh, people will persist. And that is how Ethiopians were able to defeat uh, the Italians and become the only country in Africa that was never colonized. So when these uh, uh, important spiritual icons are taken from Ethiopia and are housed in a, an institution that sees them as objects, as artifacts, it uh, represents uh, 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 a constant de uh, denigration and desacralization of uh, the uh, spiritual icons of other countries. Now, this is just one example that, that comes from Ethiopia, but if you look at other uh, traditions as well, indigenous Australians or other indigenous people in the world, Africans, uh, 
their important spiritual icons are taken away from them and they are housed in these institutions. And that makes me think the value of these uh, important regions in Western museums uh, as, as a significant thing to really research on by highlighting, by showing their significance to the real owners of these treasures. So these treasures that you've just spoken about that hold such an importance to you and what led you into to researching this, have they, is there any moves to repatriate them back to Ethiopia or do they still yeah. sit in Britain? They still sit in Britain. The British uh, refused to return them. There has been a constant call to uh, repatriate these uh, important treasures back to Ethiopia as there have been calls around the world from indigenous people, from governments for repatriation of their uh, important artifacts. Um, but what is also uh, important in, in uh, the call for return of these artifacts is that the, um, there are contesting or different interests towards these artifacts depending on how people relate to them. For example, for governments, this is a question of nationalism. It's a question of showing that we have history and, and uh, politically we have to exist as political uh, you know, uh, society. So it's important for them in that perspective. But within states, there are indigenous people, there are spiritual people who have special connection with these items, like the tablets, the tablets, or the Ark of the Covenant in Ethiopia. The way government sees these icons, even within that country, differs from the way people who are spiritually connected with them see them. Uh, so, there, so from the point of view of uh, people whose spiritual identity was taken away, this has been a constant uh, grief. There has been a constant call for the repatriation of these items. But from government side, of course, it depends on the temperature of the time. In recent times when, uh, for example, French President Macron uh, says that they are willing to return African artifacts, there was a panic, there was uh, a kind of uh, response all over the world. Uh, you know, uh, from museums, for example, they see them from the point of view of how they connect with this, with this treasure. So the question becomes quite contentious, but in recent times it become uh, so important uh, that people become aware of these things and there's an increased public pressure as well uh, asking that this uh, historical wrongs has to be amended. You touched on it just briefly there around it depends on the temperature of the time and, and what's going on. But what are some of the key um, prompts for these countries that we mentioned mm. earlier to repatriate these stolen artifacts to their original homes? Uh, I think there are uh, important items in terms of the uh, significance of cultures, for example, in recent times. Uh, people have become aware that their identity matters in a time where uh, through globalization, uh, a lot of uh, uh, national identities were devalued, then people started to kind of feel that identity is very important, that they want to bring back their uh, treasures to their own culture. Uh, in other part, in, in, on the other side of the coin, governments also see these items, repatriation, for example, as an important way of uh, healing or reconnecting or getting benefits out of uh, uh, building relationships with countries which are increasingly becoming detached from them. Uh, from the point of view of indigenous people, people who have a special spiritual and cultural connection with this, it's a question of cultural survival. You cannot maintain your culture without the material existence of these artifacts which represents that culture. So in order for cultures to continue to thrive, people need these materials back to their homes. So the struggle of these uh, indigenous peoples or people who have this special connection with artifacts now uh, started to be voiced through other channels uh, and it become increasingly important that these things be returned. Do you have an idea of the number of stolen artifacts that still need to be repatriated to their homes? Well, that is a very good question. And it's very hard really to know how many mm -hmm. artifacts are stolen. 
uh, there are hundreds of thousands, there are, for example, about hundreds of thousands of artifacts of uh, indigenous uh, First Nations uh, peoples exist all over the world in North America, in Europe. There are, for example, about 73,000 uh, Sub Saharan African artifacts in the British Museum alone. Uh, there are like more than 6,000 Ethiopian indigenous Giz manuscripts. Uh, uh, in, main, in, in all of our European uh, museums. This is without considering the, the, the artifacts, or we call them even artifacts. They sh they, we should not call them artifacts, actually, <laughs> because these are living treasures uh, uh, in private collections, for example. There's a massive number of things which are, uh, which, which, uh, which are in the hands of private collectors. Uh, we, the reason why we shouldn't call them also artifacts is because uh, Take, for example, Ethiopian Giz manuscripts. A lot of these were written uh, in the 16th century, in the 15th century, in the 17th, 18th century. About a million manuscripts were written in Ethiopia in the Giz indigenous languages. Now, these books cannot be read by Europeans, by these museums and uh, libraries which house them. But they can be read by indigenous students in Ethiopia. Uh, I've been uh, researching and went to visit these schools. There are hundreds of schools, but the children there do not have textbooks because their textbooks are stolen or looted away. And their teachers can no longer reproduce them because the government or the system doesn't really support them. Uh, so these are not just treasures to be displayed for people uh, and visit them. These are living textbooks, which are essential material for people to uh, continue uh, with their tradition and, 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 and have them. Do you think maybe there needs to be a change in the way that the general population sees these? You've sort of said that around, they're not artifacts, they're treasures. Yeah. Um, from a personal perspective, um, and I feel a little ignorant in, in admitting this, but when I have visited uh, museums, particularly in Canberra, in the nation's, in Australia's capital, I've looked at these particular artifacts that, you know, were not from Australia and thought, oh, wow, that's really interesting. And, and thought of just, oh, how lucky am I to, to view these without thinking about the connection to the people that own them in their home country. So do you think that there really needs to be a, a change in the way maybe the general population views this in order to, to change how they're viewed and then repatriated potentially. Absolutely, absolutely. Because you know, what these things represent from the point of view of indigenous people, Ethiopians and Africans, what these people represent is a continuation of colonization. Because you know, there are at least three forms of colonization. Uh, the first one is the colonization of um, places, you know, African places and countries were physically colonized in the past, we know that. Uh, but there is another form of colonization, which is a colonization of knowledge, which we really don't talk about. Because when Europeans take away uh, these treasures from, from Africa, from indigenous populations and so on, they did it on the assumption, on the belief that they are actually preserving or taking away something important because the Europeans viewed themselves as the custodians of humanity, like they they, 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 they keeping it in the name of uh, the human race, mm. which represents only themselves. So you see, the colonization of knowledge means that people who produced this knowledge cannot be trusted with their own history, that they cannot really use them for the benefit of humanity. So the entire assumption of keeping these artifacts in Western museums, the argument, lies on, uh, it rests on this basic idea that these people are incapable of having their own history unless we hold it for them. So by taking away their history, uh, and, and if you look into uh, the colonial history of Africa, what happened is first, Africa was simply perceived as an empty place or indigenous people are perceived as primitive. And once they are denied of the ha the, us having history and so on, then whatever they have has to be taken away from them that legitimizes their robbing of their history and, and, and putting it in, in the hands of uh, Western uh, museums and collectors. Uh, so decolonization is a very important process in this regard because it kind of brings back to the center the importance of this material artifacts or treasures 
into the hands of people who, who own them. On the other side of the argument, if I can yeah. sort of explore this, can Western institutions that are holding these artefacts, mm. can they benefit from returning them to their original homes? Absolutely. I, I, I believe so because um, the, the, the very foundation of Western institutions, their claim is that they are keeping it for the benefit of humanity. But at least at this stage, they cannot continue to argue that way because these places have all uh, the, the capacity to maintain or to keep these, these treasures in their own countries. And also the center, the idea that Europe is the only center of the world, that the rest of the world has no knowledge or capacity to maintain uh, these treasures is, 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 is false. It does not, because there are now other important centers of the world where Europe's significance in terms of being the culture, the, the custodian of the world of culture uh, is, is uh, untenable at this stage. So the argument is, is lost. But what they can do to be part of this human history and, and preserving and maintaining these artifacts is to constructively engage with the real owners of these treasures. Because for the period that has passed until now, from the time when these artifacts were looted or taken away, to the present, there's a history of preserving them, there's a history of keeping them in their, in their museums, and there is also an ongoing story about this as part of the, the human story. So it is possible to reconstruct uh, and maintain that history of preservation and also continue to have uh, uh, interaction with the rest of the world. When I talk about repatriation, it doesn't necessarily mean that every hundreds and thousands of item uh, has to be emptied and taken away and be returned to African countries. Repatriation is a principle, a principle which says that these items belong to the real owners. But what do we do after that depends on the agreement, the relationship that these institutions create with these real owners uh, of these uh, artifacts. So I don't think and I don't perceive that everything that was taken will be returned back to these countries. But there is a possibility of creating a partnership where countries will have, for example, these indigenous um, manuscripts, uh, which are digitized in the West, they, they have them in a digital form. Probably the original manuscripts could go back to Ethiopia and be used by people who are there to reproduce them by hand because you know they don't have computers they cannot really use the digital uh, and they are not in a digital era back home back mm -hmm. back in Ethiopia uh, unlike in, in in the west uh, so repatriation is a recognition that an injustice was done and that we recognize that these items are uh, owned by the people from where we took them uh, but after that, the implementation could be a matter of agreement. So the argument isn't to sort of strip all of the na all of the world's major museums of artifacts from other countries, mm. but perhaps it could help educate the wider world as to the injustices that have happened too. Yeah. Is that is that an argument? Absolutely. What what comes as a benefit by creating this uh, possibility of healing, of reconnecting. Uh, is much more important than these material benefits the museums get by collecting entrance fees from visitors and so on. Because, you know, what, what, when we look at these, uh, uh, we call them artifacts, but these treasures, what we do is we are responding to the call for justice by, by a lot of people. And we are also correcting wrongs in how we represent other people's cultures. The tablets that I mentioned from Ethiopia are not treasures. The way we also represent, uh, or vi when we visit museums, we see what curators allow us to see. We don't really see these treasures from the point of view of the narratives, the history that they had from their original places. If you go to Ethiopia, the, I mean, the British Museum, uh, looted artifacts are incorporated into the, the history of uh, uh, British colonial empire. They are not incorporated in the history of Ghana or Benin or Ethiopia from where these artifacts were taken away. Not just artifacts, human remains. Mm. 
body parts still exist in thousands in different parts in, in different museums in the West. Some of these human remains were taken from people who were struggling against the colonial invasion uh, and whose heads were cut off and sent for scientific studies in, 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 into the West. There's so many parts of the human remains that exist within these countries. You see, what we do by saying that this has to be returned is actually saving ourselves, saving humanity from this barbaric way of stripping cultures, stripping identities from other people. And the healing effect would be tremendously important for the general public in discussing the significance of these items. But if we leave them in Western institutions, the narrative of only those who have material interest on this will remain dominant. That we are the saviors of other people's cultures. Our uh, uh, colonial history was important. Colonization is significant. That making that connection with colonialism remains intact. So the question is, do we prefer a decolonized future? A future where we start to value the culture of other people. We take pride and be happy in the happiness of other people who now enjoy the benefit of keeping these artifacts in our museums until now and are now we are willing to return it back to them and see that they're, they are reconnected with them. Because this uh, important treasures hold, uh, the, the, these are sources of memory. People remember what happened in the past and reconnect with the future and the present by using these items. But in Western museums, we don't really feel connected with any sort of humanity by going and visiting them. We see them as kind of uh, items of curiosity. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't really connect them with our own identity. We, if anything, we connect them with a colonial, brutal empire and kind of use them to rewrite in a positive light what colonialism was. So the purpose of these items is actually to kind of hide the crime of colonialism, to make it look like that it was an expedition to save these things for the benefit of humanity. That humanity means, you know, us only, those who have access to these museums, because indigenous people cannot come and worship or participate culturally uh, in, in the presence of these, these artifacts in the West. With your research, are you seeing a potentially brighter future for these countries, particularly who have had their artifacts and their treasures taken? Yes, uh, yes I do. Uh, because uh, one of my research is, for example, on what I call knowledge grabbing and epistemic violence. What I mean by that is the grabbing of knowledge means the taking away of these important sources of knowledge physically comes with another form of violence, which I call epistemic violence. Epistemic violence is violence by means of knowledge, which means that in, in, in many instances through my research, I show how the misinterpretation of, the misunderstanding of the significance of these treasures by scholars who have no you know, uh, uh, enough understanding of this, these uh, uh, treasures have created what I call a kind of colonial type of knowledge. I can give you an example from Ethiopia where these indigenous manuscripts from Ethiopia were taken away and are held in Western museums. These are written in the Giz language and the only people who are perfect in the language who can understand the meaning of the language are Ethiopians who study for more than 30 years in the indigenous traditional school system. Uh, but uh, these, are, these treasures are now translated in the West by uh, professors, by people who don't understand the language. They, they translate them because there is no as such anyone who can oversee the accurate translation of these texts. And because they have the power, the funding and so on to translate these texts, distribute them into the general population, they create a misrepresentation of the culture of that people. And in my recent research, for example, I reviewed one big entire book that was written in, in, in medieval times in Ethiopia and translated by Western scholars who don't have the training 
uh, of that language, the training in that language, uh, and disseminated it across the world. When I looked into that book, and I went back to Ethiopia and I asked the scholars, I have also uh, uh, researched, I have studied uh, a bit in the Giz literature as well. There's an entire misrepresentation because these scholars created some sensational stories that would make their translation popular in the world. So that just shows you that the existence of these treasures in the hands of people who don't really have special connection with them or the training in them, not only strips away the culture from the people, but also allows them to reproduce misrepresentations, orientalization of these uh, artifacts or these this, uh, treasures, and misleading the entire world. So museums, universities can create partnerships, can allow the flourishing of knowledge that would benefit all of us because knowledge doesn't have uh, boundaries. My interest in this type of research is not to simply say that these artifacts belong to certain groups of people. It's not out of uh, supporting a particular view of nationalism. It is actually saying that we all will benefit uh, best when these materials are in the hands of people who care for them, who can use them to interpret the world, to reimagine the future, so that these people will not continue to grieve about, about the loss of their uh, cultural treasures. Instead, they become part of the world where they also contribute what's best in their cultures. We've spoken a lot about institutions, but there have been reports of artifacts being sold on Facebook in recent months. Mm -hmm. So I suppose, how and why are people stealing artifacts today and how can we prevent it from happening in the future? That is a great uh, question because the, the sad reality is there is still a market for it. Uh, there are so many wars happening all over the world. And as it was in the past, if you look at the collections in British Museum and in other museums, these collections exist in colonizers, in colonial countries. And that is because when people went out to these colonized places, when war was happening, for example, colonial wars, museums on institutions would send their own representatives to look for artifacts and bring them back home. So these were collected at the backdrop of behind wars and violence. So still that happens today. Whenever there are wars, there are conflicts, there's uh, an increasing interest to have these items uh, collected. I am not sure about the intention of Facebook whether they would go ahead with this notion of uh, uh, repatriation, for example, tracing them back to, uh, to their real owners because the public doesn't have uh, control over Facebook. Uh, but it is really interesting to have awareness that what we see online in museums might mean so much for people who don't have access, who don't uh, have access to these things. In an ideal world, how could we all work together globally to return artifacts to their original homes? I think that is, uh, uh, that is possible and very important. We need to start to reimagine the future that allows all societies, all cultures to participate and contribute the best within them. And, we, and for that to happen, we have to stop this hierarchy, the claim that because we have good facilities uh, on the base of our facilities, these things must be ours. We have to instead come with the perspective that honors the relationships and ideals of all cultures together. I think that can be created only through public pressure. Of course, government, politicians are now talking about this. Uh, they want to return back these items. But there are also con ongoing concerns. The concern is that with the return of these artifacts to governments may not respond to the needs of indigenous people who are powerless within those countries. Because what we have seen, for example, in many parts of Africa and other places is the westernization of the state. States hold and create similar institutions like the West, museums, uh, and so on. So if re repatriation is changing museums from Western museums to African museums, for example, 
it may not it may not address the question of justice the question of having those spiritual relationships for indigenous people so it is important to accommodate all interests within different countries and if value the importance of these things for example in in, in australia indigenous uh, indigenous treasures uh, are important for all of us in having that connection with this country, with this land, and with indigenous First Nations people. Because we, if, if we look at artifacts only as serving the interests of one particular group, we will lose the big picture. Because the history of one group is also the history of the human race. And the same way Europeans like to say that their history belongs to the history of all people, we have to also think that the history of indigenous populations, Africans, Asians, and so on, is also the history of humanity. And the question is, how do we actually value all and create a mechanism, a dialogue across cultures, through research, through exchange of ideas and knowledges for a future that would allow all of us to be part of? So if we are guided by that spirit, by that, by that principle, then repatriation will not be a question of competing nationalisms between different states. It becomes a matter of nurturing diversity, nurturing dialogue, and, and a pluriversal world. And just lastly, why is that history or history in general so important for the future? Uh, because history is not about the past. We create history to reimagine or to think about the future. We cannot really talk about everything that happened in the past. We don't have the time, we cannot do it. What we do is we select what happened in the past, depending on what we want in the present and in the future, and we create a narrative that would guide us into the future. If you really look into how history has been used in the past, uh, we go to museums and places of war memorials, places that honor violence in most parts, is that is something that really tries to tell us about the present and the future because we choose in history often wars and we, re we connect those wars to kind of show to the world to tell ourselves that we came from a particular violent place. But that can change because in the past, it's not only war, there were also traditions, cultures, love, literature, art, and so on. By remembering those cultures and artists and great things, we can create a narrative that would guide us into a better future. If we continue to imagine history as a history of war, the history itself become a war against the future. How do we change the future to become a, sp a space that would guide us into peace, into valuing the cultures, involves this decolonizing, this colonial warlike understanding of the past by reimagining and recreating it with narratives that are beautiful, that are inclusive of all cultures. Thank you, Yurga, for coming in and sharing your knowledge and passion on this topic. Certainly sounds like there's a lot to do in this space, but it was incredibly interesting to hear about the future of these artifacts or treasures as you referred to them. So thank you so much. Thank you. You've been listening to The Future Of, the podcast powered by Curtin University. Leave us a comment wherever you find this episode. We'd love to hear from our listeners. And if you've got something out of the episode, please remember to rate us. You can also subscribe and share any of our episodes. Remember to find them in the feed. Until next time, bye for now.